But I'll text Dr. Crotty about it. I, I joined you, Mazin, and so actually I'm able to record. Okay, perfect. All right. So, all right, so we're going to start with case one. So, a 49 year old man with a DVT considered for ECMO due to massive PE has received TPA with one episode of cardiac arrest, now with ROSC, um, but with refractory shock. So, the plan is for bedside cannulation. So, um, we're going to start the case. All right, so the first thing is um, what is the best configuration of an ECMO on this patient that has um, a massive PE? And so you guys can go through the information, his height, his weight, his age. Um, he looks like he's acidotic. And um, put, um, put your answers in the chat. Great, it looks like everyone's choosing VA ECMO. So, you know, the reason why you're going to choose VA ECMO in this patient, because I think what you need to decide is what type of shock are they in, right? And so this patient is in cardiogenic shock, likely RV failure, right, from the massive PE. If you look at his imaging here, um, you can see the RV on the ultrasound. I can't point to it because it takes it off. But you can see the RV on the echocardiogram. The RV is dilated. It's, the septum is bowing into the LV. So if you put them on VA ECMO, you're, not, you're gonna support the RV. So how are you supporting the RV? So you're gonna do two things, right? The RV gets, um, it gets um, blood supply throughout the whole cardiac cycle. So one, you'll increase your blood pressure because so, you're on VA ECMO. Two, you're gonna offload the RV because your venous cannula is gonna basically be like a massive drain, right? So you're going to drop the CVP. It's basically like diuresing a patient. You're going to take a bunch of blood out, um, out of the central veins and you're going to decompress the RV. And by decompressing the RV, you're going to allow the LV to dilate again and the LV is going to have better um, output. And that's going to increase your MAP. And your MAP is really important also to, um, to give for coronary perfusion of the RV. Now, if you guys have questions, always please stop me. Right, so that's why we're going to put this patient on VA ECMO. If you gave put this patient on VV ECMO, you're just going to return blood right back to the um, RA, and so you're not decompressing the RV at all, and you're not supporting them um, hemo hemodynamically. All right, so we'll go to the next question. What's the best options for venous drainage cannula location in this patient? So what to so which place would you guys place them? That's right, the femoral vein. Doesn't matter if it's right or left, it really doesn't matter. What we usually do when we're cannulating these patients, we take this, the cannula, the drainage cannula, we get to their xiphoid, and we put it right there. The reason why is you won't put the drainage cannula in the SVC, I mean, you won't put it in the hepatic IVC, I apologize. You won't put the drainage cannula in the hepatic IVC. The actual um, liver, the hepatic IVC, actually stents open the IVC, so there's less collapsibility there. So that's why when we check them, check for the venous drainage cannula on ECMO, we want it right underneath the right at the diaphragm, because then it's in the um, in the hepatic IVC, preventing the collapse. These cannulas, you want them usually as big as possible, because you want as much drainage as possible, especially for VV ECMO. It's not as important for VA ECMO, depending on what your flows are, but really you want to put as large cannula as possible. It's usually around like a 25 French now. Look, you can go down to about 21 French, which a lot of places place, a lot of people place, but the 25 French is usual, and you usually ultrasound them beforehand because you want to look at, we look at their IVC, um, we look at their femoral vein size and decide what size cannula we can put in there. Let's see. Okay, so where's the best place for arterial drainage or arterial drainage cannula, the inflow cannula? Yeah, the femoral artery. So um, the femoral artery is it's one of the easiest places to access. Um, so that's usually why we put it. It's much easier to access and much safer to access than the 
uh, carotids because the problem is you is antigrade flow. So you're going to put the cannula here, and you're going to put a retrograde up the um, up towards the heart. All VA ECMO now we always put a uh, a um, antigrade catheter in because we want to dist uh, perfuse distally perfuse the extremity. It used to be some people would put retrograde they'd put the retrograde femoral artery catheter in and they would only put in the anti-grade catheter to feed the distal leg if they needed it. And we found out a lot of patients eventually always need it and why risk a limb, right? So now we always put in the, we put in both cannulas in the artery, the, the large um, retrograde one, which goes towards the heart and the small one to feed the leg. A lot of times now we're actually trying, the anti-grade catheter is placed in the femoral artery that, um, where you place your retrograde catheter catheter because you want to feed the limb so you want to feed, suppose you put it in the patient's left uh, femoral artery you want to feed the left lower leg right because if that anti-grade catheter if you put if the retrograde catheter is large which we usually put about 15 to a 17 French in if it's large you may you may um, impede perfusion to the lower left lower extremity so that's why we always put a anti-grade catheter you um, Let's see. So I think that was the main points I wanted to say about the cannulation. Um, we try to, so a lot of places used to put the cannulas both on the same side, the, the drainage and arterial, which makes sense because they're like, oh, they're right next to each other. We can hit them both at the same time. But for PT, what we actually found, it's easier to PT them if they're both on separate legs. So we usually put a femoral drainage cannula on one leg and then the arterial cannula on the other. And then we suture the cannulas on the inner thighs. And the idea is then we can have the patients walk. So that's why we sometimes flip, we don't put them on the same side. It's harder for a patient to walk if they're both on the same side. All right. The patient now is connected to ECMO circuit. The femoral vein cannula and the femoral artery return cannula is the ECMO pump meeting the predicted flow goal. So they're basically saying, what's the flow of the ECMO? So you guys can look down here. It's the same information, but a new box popped up, which is this. And then you can see the flow, and it's asking, is that flow good enough? Margaret is saying no. Why, Margaret? Since no one's talking, I got to call you guys out. Here, I'll, unmute my, I'll unmute myself. Um, it was just a combination of looking through, well, first the flow was at 3.5, and I believe like most people have a cardiac output of around five to six. And then let me see if I can pull up the other view, but I think there were some other factors that weighed in to why I thought that just based off the um, mm -hmm. pH um, and uh, some of the values um, just, on there, so it just needs like a better oxygen delivery based off how much FiO2 and, and other things they're requiring. The answer is no, and you know, the way the reason their reasoning behind it is that if you take the patient's be, uh, body surface area, right, it turns out to be about 2.1, which is the height times the weight divided by 360, you take the square root. Okay, so it's 2.1, and you multiply by 2.4. And that's a flow index. And the idea is you have this flow index that you multiply by their BSA to decide what their flow should be. This is actually way more tricky. And this is not really how we try. We, that we do this at the beginning, maybe when we first um, initiate people on ECMO to decide their initial flows. But this is not really the best way of um, choosing what your flow should be. Your flow on ECMO is what the patient needs, right? So if this patient. Um, if we gave this patient five, six, seven liters, which is, we rarely get that high, but we give them that, that, uh, that high of flow, we could actually choke off the LV, right? Because you're going to have high flows that the LV has to fight against, right? So you will basically give the patient what they need. And this patient, it's not about the flow into the arterial system as much as also you want to remember that you want to offload the RV. So you want to, you want a lot of drainage. So if you increase the flow, you're going to be able to Increase, um, you can increase the drainage from the um, central venous system. And by doing that, you're gonna offload the RV. 
but this patient's LV is completely fine, all right? Um, and you know that one by the echocardiogram, two, the other, the other thing is the patient has, if you look at the vitals, the patient actually has a good pulse pressure, all right? And the reason I'm saying that is that if, you're, if this patient's blood pressure was 65 or 55, that means the LV was purely failing, right? And if you choked off the LV, if you have a failing LV and you give really, really high flows, you're going to have to find a way to um, offload the LV, and that's when we add in impellas or intraocular balloon pumps. Um, oh, sorry, wrong room. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next one. Um, the patient is now on predicted flow on ECMO, so let's take a look. So they increased the flow to five liters. By doing that, let's look at what happened to the blood pressure. The blood pressure got better. And they're still good. There's still pulse pressure good, so you know the LV is working well. Remember, if you start seeing the pulse pressure decrease, you have to be start worrying about the LV because there's no, they're not venting the LV. Remember, venting the LV is putting a device in to take the blood out of the LV and into the aorta. So that'd be something like an impella or interior balloon pump. Most centers use interior balloon pumps. Some centers use impellas. There's a little mortality benefit, about 10% uh, mortality benefit if you put a after load reduction agent in there. After load, uh, uh, sorry, LV venting device in. So the patient is now predict, uh, on predictive flow on ECMO, and the RV has been adequately decompressed on echocardiogram. So let's take a look at the echocardiogram. So you can see the um, RV is much smaller now. The LV has increased in size. Um, what is your next step in managing this patient? Decrease vasopressors. Stop that. Give me, give me <laughs> one second. So I agree, the um, plan is to decrease the vasopressors. So the blood pressure was adequate and um, the, the patient was still on dobutamine, 10 mics per kilogram per minute while it's a high dose, norepi of 0.4 mics per kilogram per minute and vasopressin. So um, remember for the RV, you always wanna make sure there's an adequate map, right? Cause that, um, the RV gets um, oxygen or the um, right coronary um, gets blood throughout the whole cardiac cycle, not just diastole like the LV. So you always wanna make sure that a failing RV due to like a massive PE is getting, um, those patients have high um, maps. So, but now with ECMO, you're gonna be able to start dropping these. Let's see. All right, so decrease, yep. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? Usually for massive PEs, remember that um, there's a mortality benefit li likely to diuresing these patients when you look at large when you look at large um, registries. So most patients with RV failure due to massive PE, um, they do, will need diuresis. In this way, the patient was slightly in a way the RV was kind of diuresed, quote unquote, by putting a large drainage cannula in the CV in the um, femoral vein. All right. Oh, um, just to talk about this picture, this picture is um, right now incorrect. This is a VV ECMO uh, picture. I just want you guys to appreciate that. So the vein, drainage cannula is in the patient's right femoral vein, but the return cannula is actually also um, in the, it went into the patient's uh, right um, IJ and then going back into the RA. So um, this is a VV configuration, it's not VA. So it's an incorrect picture. So vasopressors and inotropes uh, are now decreased. What's your next step in circus, circuit initiation? What is the sweep gas? It's a great question. The sweep is three. You guys all should have core ECMO up on your screen, hopefully, and following along. So the sweep is three with a, and this is the ABG. 
Change the sweep. Great. What would you do with this sweep? Increase it. Great. So you're going to increase the sweep because sweep is basically like ventilation, right? Mm -hmm. And you are going to drop the PaCO2 because this patient, uh, and then what would, and you would normalize the pH, correct? So change that and you can fix the respiratory acidosis. Perfect. Does anyone have any questions about that? Remember for ECMO, ECMO is really good at removing carbon dioxide. Um, it's, and, car and the removal of carbon dioxide is dependent on your sweep, obviously. To oxygenate blood, that's more dependent on flow. You need much higher flows to oxygenate blood, all right, than sweep. You can remove a lot of CO2 and have lower flows, like flows in the three liters. But to oxygenate, to oxygenate patients, especially like in severe ARDS, you want much higher flows, no five. All right, so what would you do to, to this uh, sweep uh, flow rate? Here it is right now. What would you do to it? Yeah, increase it to four, I agree. Now, um, the reason they give you this equation, right? So it's, simil it's similar to like minute ventilation and CO2. So if your desired sweep, you can always turn, change sweep to minute ventilation. That's how you change, you know, ventilator settings to adjust your CO2. Um, so basically uh, the desired CO2, which the, in this case was 40, and then the current sweep, which was three, current CO2, 55, and they wanted, and then that, the answer is four. So you go up to like four liters. Now, just some things about sweep. You do not want to ever change sweep quickly on ECMO because you can change someone's CO2 significantly. Our nurses, when we're changing the sweep on ECMO, aren't allowed to change sweep more than 0.5 liters a minute at a time without then checking a gas. And the reason is you can significantly change the sweep and make them significantly acidotic and significantly alkalotic. Um, with uh, ECMO changes, with ECMO sweep changes. And the reason why that's so important is because of, um, because of uh, perfusion of the brain. Basically, you don't want um, a huge, uh, you don't want huge changes in your CO2 because that's gonna change your uh, cerebral perfusion. So most people wouldn't change more than one liter a minute at a time. In fact, our institution usually it's about 0.5 liters. So after the circuit is initiated, the PTT levels are subtherapeutic after the bolus. Continuing heparin would be a contraindication in which of the clinical scenarios? Hit, that's right. So um, hit is basically one of the uh, co biggest contraindications to continuing heparin on ECMO. Um, and a lot of ECMO circuits now are, are lined with heparin, uh, which is, can be a problem if they have HIT. Um, thankfully, we've seen very r rare cases of HIT on ECMO at our institution. The nice thing about the new um, auctionators, um, they're much smaller. And um, because of the way they're made, they actually clot a lot less. And so we actually run patients, especially for VV ECMO without heparin, if there's ever, if there's ever like bleeding complications, airway bleeding, wherever oozing, we can always stop heparin and they can run without heparin for days. Some people have gone weeks without any heparin, especially for VV ECMO. VA ECMO, you have to be very careful because if you have any clots in the arterial system that can easily cause a stroke. Let's see. After 12 hours, the ECMO uh, pump experiences this alarm and you notice something abnormal happening with the venous tubing. What is the best way to manage the situation? Let's see. So you can watch the, the picture. So what do you guys think is happening? If you look at a darker cannula, What do you think?
Yeah, that's cheap. That is definitely tube chatter from now. It's not from low. It's it, it, the patient, the, the ECMO circuit will have low flow because of the tube tube chatter. And that usually is occurring because what's happening is the actual cannula itself is getting sucked up against the wall of the IVC. And what happens when that occurs, the the motor, which is a centrifugal motor, will actually um, pause for a second to let the cannula off the wall because the flow's dropped. And so that's why the RPM drops. And then the alarms will come off that the flow dropped. So usually you can turn down the speed. And if you do that, you're going to turn down the suction of that cannula. So hopefully it stops that suction event. And sometimes these patients, um, like, like we said, it's a patient that's with a PE, with RB failure. A lot of times we'll start diuresing them. But if you over diurese them, this can occur. That's exactly similar to Impella. That's exactly right. All right. All right, so after 24 hours, the patient is turned and the ECMO pump shows a high arterial pressure alarm. Which of the following could be causing this? So if you see the P arc, it's 300. It previously was probably around the 200 or so. Um, the P venous is negative 60, which is completely appropriate. Um, the P int, which is the pressure before the um, oxygenator. Um, and so the P int is before the oxygenator. P art is after the oxygenator. So the delta P is probably is 330 minus 307. It's 23. That's about normal. Most normal is about 40. You never want to see doubling. When you see doubling, you worry about oxygenator failure. So great. Someone said cannula malposition. Let's take a look. Yep. So there, you know, you turn the patient. There's a kink in the return cannula, and uh, it causes the pressures to rise. Yep. And so high arterial pressures can cause hemolysis. That's absolutely right. So let's keep on moving. On day two, the patient uh, undergoes catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis and remains on ECMO from IR. He develops hypoxemia. Why is a patient hypoxemic? So I would go through all of these again. So it looks like his right radial ABG is 85% SAO2, but the left radial ABG is 100. Hmm. His right radial ABG has a a PaO2 of 50, while the left has 300, 340 to be exact. If you look at the ventilator settings, notice what happened to the peak and then the plateau. The peak pressures went to 40 and the plateau is 17. So you think it's malposition? Can you be a little more uh, specific malposition of what? Looks like he's setting really low on the right side, but on his left upper extremity, he's setting uh, normal. Yeah, so he thinks it's a tube. Yeah, it makes sense. Let's take a look all the way at the imaging. Oh no, looks like his right lower, his right lobe collapsed. Well, actually I should say, do you guys think it's collapsed or filled with fluid? Collapse. That's right. If you look at the x-ray, it looks like there's volume loss because the whole the trachea and the whole heart is actually uh, deviated towards the right side. Absolutely right. Great. Echocardiogram looks about the same. If you look at the ECMO circuit, it looks like everything's normal on it. All right. So what do you guys think the answer is? It's called North-South syndrome, right? So remember, when we put people on ECMO, we put a right we put a right sided arterial line in on the right radial. If especially if they're femoral cannula um, and their turn cannula is in the femoral artery, and the reason is the right radial hand is what's seeing the blood from your lungs and your heart, and that assumingly is also what your brain is seeing. 
while your left hand is seeing more from the ECMO circuit. This all depends on how strong, how well your LV is functioning. If your LV is functioning really, really poorly, right, the ECMO, um, the blood coming from the ECMO circuit is going to travel farther up the aorta, all the way up to your left hand, and sometimes even go to part, parts of your brain, like your left coronary, uh, sorry, left carotid. If you um, have a really strong heart, then your ECMO, if your LV is working really well and EF is um, normal, um, then it's going to be able to fight the basically ECMO circuit and the area of um, where the ECMO's blood is reaching the LV blood is going to be further down the aorta. So that's basically what happened with this patient. Um, so right here, the, pa the uh, lungs collapsed, so the blood going through the heart and the lungs was coming out of the heart and it was perfusing the right side of the patient's body. And um, that's why the SATs were lower here, while the SATs were higher on the left hand because the ECMO circuit was coming up the aorta and going down the left hand. This is why we always put a right radial artery in because, because well, we should, we should say right radial artery if you're firmly arterially cantilated. That's your trying cannula. Because you want it as far away from the ECMO circuit as possible because you want to see what the brain is actually getting. The other thing we do is put a SAT monitor on like the right ear. All right. Great job, guys. Does anyone have any questions about this case? Can you explain North South syndrome again, if you don't mind? Yeah, let me show you. It's better North South syndrome. It's actually better if I actually give you a image of it. So here you go. Um, Let's see if this is, hopefully this picture comes up. There's North or South syndrome. Here it is. All right, so North South syndrome is basically this where your ECLS, extracorporeal life support, also known as, one of them is called ECMO. Um, the arterial blood is coming back to a femoral artery. It's going up and it's arching the abdomen and going all the way up the aorta towards the LV, right? Mm -hmm. If your LV is failing and your LV doesn't work well, your ECMO circuit is going to pump all the way up, all the way, almost to the LV. You'll have a low pulse pressure, right? Because your LV is doing very little. And most of the MAP is due to your, um, your ECMO circuit. If your LV works really well, the LV is going to be able to fight off the afterload, which is caused by the ECMO machine and also your own intrinsic SVR, and they'll be able to push it further down. If your LV is working really well, the point of mixing is down here, down in your aorta. Now, the reason why this patient started desaturating was because the lungs were failing and the LV was working well, right? Because the lungs failed in, that, in our case because there was a, um, there was a uh, mucus plug in the right bronchus and it caused the right uh, lung to collapse. So the patient, so the blood that was going through the lungs, then back to the LV, then pumped out the LV and then out to the right arm, he was, uh, was low saturation. However, the left arm was getting blood from the ECMO circuit because the ECMO circuit would come up here and go down to the left arm, right? So then on the left side of his, his left hand had a, a good saturation because it was coming from the ECMO circuit. The right hand had a poor saturation because it was coming from the basically the heart and the lung and the lung at that time was failing does that make sense yeah it does thank you for explaining that and so for that to happen the problem has to be in the lung as well as in the lv as well right so both those factors need to be present for that syndrome to happen for that syndrome yeah one of them has to at least fail right so okay. suppose um the lungs were working great but then the, the LV was completely failing, right? Then right. everything in the right and left hand would probably be from the ECMO circuit. When right. the LV is doing that, suppose the LV was completely failing and you had no pulse pressure, right? The, you would basically see a map or you'd see a blood pressure of like 70 over 60. That's because the LV was basically had a very low uh, cardiac output. So um, the ejection fraction was incredibly low. The EF was incredibly low. Um, 
so uh, those are the patients that what we do is we put an impella on them because then we um, we basically de uh, we decompress the LV by putting the impella in or intraaortic balloon pump because then what happens is if you if the LV is getting smaller you can actually decompress it and it actually improves myocardial recovery because when the LV is under a lot of stress and it's basically because of the high afterload from the ECMO circuit then there's going to be increased LV oxygen consumption and that's going to damage the LV and prevent it from healing. So does anyone have any other questions about this case or can we move on? All right, so we're going to move on to a second case. We only have about 15 minutes, so we're going to go or 17 minutes, we'll go a little faster, but we, I kind of explained a little more about ECMO, so we'll probably uh, do a little less explanations for some of these things. But please interrupt and please uh, ask any questions uh, if you have any. So 29-year-old woman, ARDS, considered for ECMO due to severe hypoxemia, despite sedation, optimizing PEEP, um, neuromuscular blockade, inhaled pulmonary arterial vasodilators, and proning. So they've done everything. So they're considering her for ECMO. All right, so what type of ECMO would you put her on? Her age, apparently she just aged a few years. She's 42 years old now. Here's her gas. Good. So I think before you choose, right, you always wanna make sure she's hemodynamically stable. She's hemodynamically stable. Good. And her vent settings, um, she has a high plateau pressure of 35, peak pressure of 45, her rest rate is 35, her peep is 20, and she's an FI2 of 100%, with the tidal volumes of four cc's per ideal body weight kilograms. All right, so you guys uh, said BV, that's good. Now, if this patient was on, let's say you checked her um, uh, vitals and her, she was on norepi four or five, or even 10, would you put on VA or would you put on VV? So I would, you'd still put her on BV, even if she had some pressure requirement. One is because it was likely due to sedation. Two patients get pretty acidotic and sometimes the pressures don't work as well. So when you put them on uh, BV ECMO, a lot of times their pressure requirement decreases. Um, and actually I found that, I uh, submitted an ATS uh, abstract about that, that we found that in our ECMO patients. If you guys look at this echocardiogram, what do you guys notice about the RV? Good RV, bad RV? Dilated, that's right. Is this unexpected for ARDS or would you say you're, you're expected, sometimes you can see that with ARDS? Absolutely, um, you can totally see this with ARDS. Um, so, but this is not a reason to put someone on VA ECMO, right? So you'll see dilated RVs, they may have a low pressure requirement and someone will argue, well, they need to be on uh, VA ECMO, and you just gotta remind people that the press requirement is likely due to sedation um, or the acidosis, um, and the dilated RV can be seen up to 20 to 30 percent of ARDSs. So you don't want to just jump to VA ECMO because you see this in the program. Great. All right. So where are you guys gonna put the drainage cannula? Femoral vein, that's right. These patients with severe ARDS require large amounts of flow. They are incredibly hypoxemic. You won't put the largest, largest drainage cannula you, your institution has in the femoral vein that the vein can take. So we usually here try to do 21 or 24, 25 French. We try to get as large as possible, like a 25 French cannula in here. Because you don't want to be flow limited. Your flow is going to be limited by how big your drainage cannula is. And remember where I said it was always in the hepatic IVC because that prevents it from collapsing. So this is where we usually put it. Good. Where, where's the best place to put the return cannula? Yep, IJ. 
you could say, why not the left IJ? Just because it's a thick kela makes it hard to make that turn. Uh, usually we place in the right IJ. Um, so there's these single lumen catheter, there's these, sorry, there's these double lumen single catheters called the Avalon or the Crescent. You guys can look on what those are. And what those are is one cannula that goes into the right IJ. You can also put them in the subclavian under floral guidance and put them into the all the way down. And they drain blood from the I, uh, SVC and the IVC and then pump it out into the RA in the middle of the cannula. And it's nice because it's one cannula. What we found, the problem with these cannulas are is that you cannot get high enough flows. These patients with severe ARDS, you want really, really high flow. So you want very low resistance from your ECMO catheters. So we always now put dual cannulas in for all our ARDS. If it's a patient that's on like an IPF patient that needs to be a bridge to lung transplant, we'll put a single Avalon in, in the subclavian under floral guidance. We don't even intubate the patient. We put them in and then the patient, can, it's even easier for a patient to PT. But we PT our patients with dual cannulas all the time. So it doesn't matter if you need single or uh, single cannula or dual cannula approach. Um, oh, and sorry, one more thing about the single cannula approach. You need a TEE guidance or you need fluoroscopy help uh, uh, guidance to place it because you got to make sure that the cannula, that single cannula doesn't go into RV and puncture the RV, which has happened before in case reports. So that's why you have to do it under TEE guidance to make sure the wire when you place in the IJ goes all the way down into the SVC if you do a single cannula approach. This is why our institution doesn't do single cannula approaches for severe RDS anymore. We're dual cannula almost always. All right, patient received a heparin bolus and is cannulated, connected to ECMO circuit. The ECMO pump is, um, uh, pump is meaning the predicted blood flow of 1.8 liters per minute per square. So do you guys remember the numbers we're looking at? So, let's see. so what is interesting? My thing is not telling me the flow of my ECMO catheter. My ECMO. So we need to know what the flow should be. So what what should be the flow beyond this patient? Do you guys know? You would calculate it using the height and weight. So basically you get the body surface area and you multiply it by that flow index that we talked about, which should be anywhere between 1.8 and 2.2 and says this patient should be on 3.59. If my calculation, let's see, 160 times 60 to get the body surface area and then you multiply that by the flow index, which is about 2.2. I don't know what the flow is, so I can't see. Here's the number, perfect. So it was correct. I just couldn't, we can't see it right now for some reason, it's a little error. So we calculate the patient's body surface area, which we did, and then you multiply it by the this predictive flow index. Now, most patients with VV ECMO, we don't put in cannulas trying to decide, oh, what is the maximum, the flow that we're trying to achieve, and we'll put in cannulas that size. We just always try to put in the biggest cannulas that the veins can take. And the reason is we want as high flow as possible, as we've already talked about. I bet if we hit next, so what was the flow? The flow was three, and so they want a little higher flow. Um, since the initiation onto VVF mode, there's been some improvement in the saturation. What is the most appropriate intervention to further improve oxygenation? So here's the pre ECMO gas, PO2 of 44. Here's the vent setting, still the same one as before. The saturation is 88. So what are you going to do to the ECMO to um, improve oxygenation? Yeah, you're going to increase the flow. So remember to remove CO2, that's dependent on your sweep, and that is not dependent on your flow, but oxygenation is dependent on your flow. So your ECMO circuit, there's very few things you can actually change on it. You can change the sweep. You can change the uh, FDO2, how much oxygen is going through that sweep. And then you can change the RPM. 
The RPM is what purely controls your flow. And the, the patient's P-Venus is negative 50. And that's pretty low. And so you can keep going up on your flows until your P-Venus gets to negative 100, negative 150, so long as there's no chatter um, or flow alarms. Um, you can keep going up on your flow. So I agree, I would turn up the RPM on this patient and I would make sure the flow goes up. I would get this flow, as when we usually initiate ECMO, we try to get them on the highest flow possible. Again, why we always put the largest cannulas in as possible. All right, so we already talked about that, perfect. Um, one of the things that's always funny when they talk about, we wanna try to get 60% of the native cardiac output, it's very hard to determine what a native cardiac output is on these patients. The ECMO blood flow rate was increased and the patient was ready to transition to a rest ventilator setting, so de-escalation of ventilator support. So let's look at the vitals. The vitals look like the stats are now 96. So would you guys uh, rest the ventilator now? Here's the vent settings. I think everyone knows the answer for this would be yes. We usually, um, when we put patients on ECMO, we put them on, we watch the SAT usually go up to right up to 100% as we increase our flows over about, about two or three minutes, making sure the PVNS doesn't change much, um, doesn't, go to, uh, to, doesn't go too negative. So this patient, they increased the flow to four liters and the PVNS went to the negative 80, which is great. So yes, we would totally wean the vent settings. And I usually do this within 15 to 30 minutes after I cannulate a patient. All right, perfect. So the next, I think, question would be, yeah, what would you do? What is your ventilator setting that you would try? So here's the vent settings right now. Respiratory 35. 5 arms of 4 cc's per kilo, peep of 20. What would you change them to? So I would argue the best option is this one right here, C. Pressure control, rate of 10, driving pressure of 10, with a peep of 10. Basically the 10, 10, 10 setting. So um, the, op the reason why option, uh, the last option is not correct is because they won't drop the peep to zero. So there's gonna be a lot of electatic trauma if you do that. Um, the reason why option, this option is not correct, the respiratory of 10, the driving pressure of 25 is too high. And if you guys remember, there was a landmark a motto study um, that was a retrospective study that looked at all the RDS studies and found that driving pressure was a, um, a big, uh, may have been the biggest contributor to mortality. So you want to get driving pressures as low as possible. So that's why the driving pressure is 10. Um, the problem with this one, the volume control, is that with um, the uh, tidal volumes of 60 cc's per kilo, you might still be stretching out the lung too much. You can go even lower. So this is probably the best option. Now, when you put people on 10, 10, 10, what do you guys think the driving pressures are gonna be? I mean, sorry, the tidal volumes are gonna be. Suppose when we put them on the setting, you know, the tidal volumes were, probably, were beforehand, four cc's per kilo, this patient was whatever, 60 kilos. So the patient's tidal volumes were probably around 300. What do you think the tidal volumes will be um, when you put them on a driving pressure of 10? the tidal volumes are gonna be incredibly small. Like they can go, especially if you have, you know, because these patients when you put them on are in severe ARDS, their compliance is very low, like in the 20s, 10s. We see tidal volumes down to 30 mLs, 50 mLs, and that's okay. So you're only basically ventilating their dead space, just their trachea, and we're resting their lung. And we do this for days until the inflammation decreases, their compliance improves, and their tidal volumes start improving on their own. So, um, it does depend on the compliance, but usually when you're putting these patients on for severe RDS, the driving the tidal volumes will be very low, and that's okay. And that requires a lot of education of your RTs 
and of your nurses allowing tidal volumes get to get down to like 50 and staying down there. Um, do we always do pressure control over volume control in these scenarios? So the reason why we, um, the pressure control one is probably a little more comfortable for our patients, even though they may be deeply sedated. The, the um, pressure control allows us to just watch what happens to compliance, because as you're doing driving pressure of 10, you'll start seeing first few days, their tie volumes are like 50, and they stay 50. And then after a few days, you're starting noticing their x is improving, and then their tie volumes are going from 50 to 70 to 100 to 150 to 500 to 200 and 300. And you know the patient's improving, and you're able to now um, transition from ECMO back to the ventilator, and then we can sometimes go back to volume control. But most of the time, we do pressure control in these in these settings. The respiratory rate. Why do you want a low respiratory rate? Respiratory rate, because you want to remember every time you give a patient a tidal volume, or um, you are stretching the lung and you're causing more ventilator-induced lung injury. All right. So we want to minimize billy. Right. The point of putting people on ECMO is to minimize billy. People always think ECMO saves people's lives with an ARDS. ECMO doesn't save an ARDS patient's life. The ECMO machine doesn't do that. The ECMO machine allows us to prevent VILI, ventilator induced lung injury. By, prevent, by decreasing VILI, we decrease biotrauma. By decreasing biotrauma, we decrease multi-organ failure. And we all know that multi-organ failure is what causes most of our ARDS patients to die. It's not hypoxemia, right? And so the point of doing this, of putting people on ECMO, is to decrease VILI, it's to drop their tidal volumes, it's to drop their plateau pressures, and um, that decreases biotrauma, and then that decreases multi-organ failure. The veterinary rest settings have been implemented and our ABG has been attained. What would you do with the sweep flow rate? So let's look at our ABG. So it's 7.29, 55, and PA2 of 60. And the sweep currently right now is at three. You increase the sweep, decrease the sweep, or don't change it at all. That's right, you'd increase the sweep. So the patient is acidemic hypercapnic, so you should increase it. Now, when you're changing sweep, a lot of um, the perfusionists or bedside nurses always want to change the CO2 to make it perfect, like 40. But a lot of times, these severe ARDS patients, we've been diuresing them, and they have a metabolic alkalosis. So if you normalize that pH, you can actually get them alkalotic. So in the end, uh, normalize the CO2, then you can make them alkalotic. So you always want to see what's happening to the pH and adjust the PaCO2 to, so you can normalize the pH. Don't feel like you have to get the PaCO2 to 40. If you, just, if you can get, get to a normal, um, if you can decrease the PSO2 to improve the pH to get to more of a normal level, 7.3 to 7.45, then that, that's the goal. The goal is not to normalize the PaCO2. This patient, they're gonna increase the sweep because they're like, well, the patient's slightly acidotic at 7.29, they wanna improve that. But you don't wanna overshoot, normalize the PaCO2 and then make them alkalotic. What should be changed? So currently it was at three. We kind of talked about this previously with our last case. We usually go up by 0.5 or, um, or one, so probably to four. Same equation. Again, we don't want to change sweep too quickly because of cerebral perfusion. All right, so sweep gas has changed, ABG is obtained, and neural blockade is discontinued, and a heparin drip is started. Then the patient becomes hypoxemic after being turned for skin care. Uh, being turned for skin care was a cause of the hypoxemia. Okay, so let's take a look at all the, um, the things they've told us. So they increased the sweep, and it looks like the new gas is better with a 7.3345, PO2 is 59. We changed it to a uh, pressure control setting. Look at the tidal volumes, 75, completely fine, completely normal with this bad compliance, with this ARDS with severely poor compliance the tidal volumes are gonna be very low with the driving pressure of 10. And we're okay with that. We're resting the lung to decrease ability. Blood pressure is okay, saturation's down as they said. Patient's still paralyzed on propenfent. What's wrong with this x-ray? So if you can see, 
the uh, right IJ, the ECMO cannula, do you see how deep it is? So the neck skin, if you don't suture these correctly, which the CT surgeons had to teach me multiple times how to suture these when I first started learning this, because my sutures were, were too medicine for them. Um, they, uh, it, these catheters can, um, uh, can move a lot. And so what happening, what's happening is the right IJ catheter was moved in way too far. And now it's basically, it's basically touching the drainage cannula. And also what a lot of these catheters have is at the end of them, there's about five centimeters that's not radio opaque that you don't see. It has a bunch of dry, uh, ports in there. So that cannula is probably, not only is it touching it, but basically it's going past it because there's about five centimeters at the end that has a bunch of reinfusion ports um, that you can't see on the x-ray. So it's way too deep. So what do you think is gonna happen to your, if you look at your ECMOs um, numbers, one number here is very concerning. So the very concerning number is the SVO2. It's 93%. So that's the blood that the drainage cannula is getting. And the drainage cannula sees a saturation of 93. That normally that saturation should be in the 70s or maybe 80s if they're paralyzed, but it should be around 70 or down to 60. So the SVO2 is way too high. So what's happening is the ECMO circuit is sucking up the blood, taking out the carbon dioxide, putting in oxygen, pumping it back into the body, and then it's resucking it up right again, right, right uh, again, because the arterial drainage, uh, the arterial, I'm sorry, the reinfusion cannula is touching the drainage cannula. And so it's just causing a big amount of recirculation. So that's what's occurring right now. A lot of recirculation. The return cannula needs to be withdrawn, which we can see again on this x-ray. The drainage cannula needs to be pulled literally about 12 centimeters, if not more. 15 centimeters. There's about five extra centimeters at the end of the cannula that you can't see, depending on what cannula you have put in there for the drainage for the reinfusion cannula. So it has you have to pull it out quite a bit. All right, the hypoxemia resolves after cannula adjustment. After five days and a significant amount of diuresis, the patient goes into a V-fib. No changes to ECMO circuit, no alarm sort of pump console. What do you do? So look at the ECMO, all the numbers on the ECMO circuit look okay, SVO2 75. Patients in VFib. Then things then change. Here's the x-ray. ET tubal is pulled a little. Reinfusion cannula is pulled back, which is appropriate. Drainage cannula is in the IVC. So what would you do? That's exactly right. You would perform routine ACLS and use rescue event settings and reduce the RPMs for chatter. So when someone codes, make sure you take them off the vent and bag them. There's no reason to keep them on the ventilator when they're coding. And VV ECMO, the cardiac, the heart is not supported. You need to do CPR, absolutely. And you should be, usually the patients, we don't even do rescue ventilator things. We just bag the patient if they're coding. All right, good. Oh, one round of CPR is done, and they got ROSC after administration of magnesium. The patient was hypokalemic and hypomagnesemia. All right, and then after a 21 day of, of VV ECMO, she was successfully decannulated. So this was a three week run, which is not completely unreasonable because she had severe ARDS and her tabums were like 70 on a driving pressure of 10. There are some patients that you put on ECMO that have much better um, tidal volumes. Because if you put them on early during their ARDS course, the ARDS hasn't worsened yet, and, but they're still really sick. And their tidal volumes may be 200 on driving pressure, and in the next few days, we'll go down to 50s or 75 or really lower numbers um, because their ARDS is worsening before it gets better. So that's a common thing. So um, do you guys have any questions right now? Please make sure to take the post test that Dr. Cardi Alexander has posted in the chat. Please let me know if you have any other questions. You can always uh, email me. 
have to find out if they learned anything from hearing all of your words of wisdom. Good luck um, being fellows next year. It's an it's a incredibly crazy time in our world, but it's very unique and you have the opportunity to help a lot of patients. So thank you for choosing to join us in Palm Grit. Also, we'll see you hopefully in ATS in person soon. Um, hopefully the next one's in San Diego and we'll be able to see each other. Agreed. Thank you so much, Dr. Odish, for leading us through these two cases. Um, you have such a calming voice, I have to say, like, I just like listening to it. So we will be posting this session. So if you feel the need to watch it again, um, it will be sent out to all of you. Um, and we have multiple more sessions over the next three weeks um, to try and get you a little bit more prepared for fellowship. So hang in there. Uh, we're rooting for you. You're going to do great. Thank you, guys. Have a good day.